when Johan was talking, there was quite a few things that I really, I, I just realized how much you mustn't see veteran in one side, feeding one side, breeding one side. It's all incorporated with each other. So I'm going to tie up with some points that Johan referred to, um, just to try and, and, and show how much all these are incorporated with each other. So the, the one thing I want to talk a bit about is feeding our bulls, and just quickly refer to a thing called gossip ball, and I'm not swearing, and something called munins, and also uh, referring to that. So the one statement that's been made is said, if you feed a warm ration, with warm we mean, we mean a lot of maize or then a lot of starch in that ration, is detrimental for bull fertility. So we did a trial at Molotech. My job is to do the, the research work in, in the company. And I did this trial quite a couple of years ago. I think it was in 2011 or 12, somewhere there. And, and, and when I give this, this talk, especially the part on the bull feeding, it's, it's like the preacher that's preaching every Sunday the same thing. And later the congregation started asking, why are you giving the same speech every Sunday? I see, and he said, when you start doing what I'm preaching to you. So I've been preaching this 10 years and I'm still preaching it on, on, on the, the so-called warm rations for our bulls. So we have two rations. We have a gewone voorkral rations, typical normal feedlot ration, high in energy, normal 12-13% protein, 8-9% fiber straightforward. The other ration that we fed, we fed a free phase bull uh, uh, ration on the right hand side there. I'm going to, oh, you can't see the red down there. You'll have to believe me now. I've set the typical finishing ration. It's about 12, 13% protein, high in energy, about 83% uh, uh, digestible nutrients, or it's under 12, 13 megajoules energy there, more or less. Right. The other ration, high in, high in fiber, high in protein, low in, 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 in energy. So we started with a 15% protein, dropped it down only to 14 over time. The starting ration was 68% total digestible nutrients, or 68% uh, there, only increasing to at the most 80%. So very low, low density, high fiber, low energy diet. We fed these animals for 115 days, 150 days, the, the two groups of animals. Now, what you will see there, the, the, the red is the ADG of the animals over the feeding period, typically starting there at 1.8 kilograms, then dropping down, increasing a bit, dropping down again. The red ones are the animals that were on the Typical feedlot ration. So, typische goede curve van die ding wat jy in die voorkraal sal sien. Jy sal toch sien, dat ons nou die val in, in groei daar en weer val in die einde. The, the yellow one are the bull finishing ration. Die la energie, hoë, hoë veesel waarde ding. Definitief is stadiger groei gehad op hom. Johan het verwees na die effect van temperatuur en hitte en omgevingseffect op die reële. Ek, ek denk ons onderskat het geweldig baie keer. The, the effect on, on the, the drop in temperature there, this work we've done in the Leidenberg area there in Mpumalanga, it was winter time, the drop in growth rates there is primary driver there was cold. We had snow in that period, temperatures dropping below zero degrees at night. The, the animals just need so much energy to keep themselves warm. Is, is die eenvoudig as om mykie vir julle. Elke graad wat die dier buiten sy gemak so in gaan, wat temperatuur aan betref, waar leid het hier die 20 grade rond 25, 20 daar onzeker. Elke graad wat die buiten jou gemak so in gaan, verhoog jou energiebehoefte van die dier met 1%. To, to make this digestible for you. If you got a wiener calf, it's in the free state, it's 15 degrees, it's winter time, standing there. Next to it, you've got another wiener calf standing at zero degrees, no wind. The energy that the, the animal at zero degrees Celsius need 
to have the same performance or don't use his own body reserves to keep warm. It's almost three quarters of a kilo of maize per day. Three quarter kilogram millis a day. Net om jou temperatuur recht te hou. That, that's why when we recommend you your wiener calves during winter time, especially those that's coming, going to get heifers or, or your replacement heifers or your bulls going forward for the, for the um, stud guys, give them production leak. Hulle gaan nie groei op hy productie leak in die winter nie, maar dit is net om te keer dat hulle eie massa begin gebruik. Op een gewone protein leak, 54% protein leak, julle weet self, hy goed verloor 20-25 kilogram. So jou productie leak is om hulle net buit te hou daar, soms jy op die kant leid, dit is die effect van temperatuur. Water. Hier sit Zander heel leak, ek het die voorraad gehad om, om lekker saam Zander te werk. Zander het vir ons een stuk werk gedoen, hy het uh, vir sy M graad vir ons klomp lammers op weiding afgerond. Hy het twee goed bewys. Die een ding, hulle vrek van blauwtong as het baie nat word, en om die jou proef stop nie, Zander, dit is die een ding wat van, jylle, Zander moet sy proef herhaal het, sy proef het uitgevrek van blauwtong. Toe hy die tweede jaar herhaal, toe reen dit verskrikkelijk. Toe het ons verskrikkelijk lekker data, wat vir ons groei kurve is en reenval het, want hy het, uh, hy het een uh, reenstaas hier op die navorsingseenheid. The simple figure that came out there. This was with sheep, but I think you can extrapolate to, to, to uh, cattle also to a certain degree. If it's wet for a whole week, more than 25 millimeters of rain, first day, and it's staying wet, 20% drop in animal performance. The correlation was about 0.71, if I remember correctly. So it's getting cold and wet and whatever. It's got a real, in, in a feedlot, you all know 10% of mud in a feedlot, 10% drop in animal performance. So try to keep them dry out of the wet as far as possible. Weer het alke groter en temperatuur het alweer groter invloed. In die koelte en die sommer vir hulle, probeer hulle vir ons ook uit die nattigheid uit te hou daar, soos ons bulle begin te afrond. So die val en groei daar, soos we afzakelijk weergedreven gewees, julle koue nat, hier op die einde daai val, Lente maande gewees, het begin te reen, kral was bykie nat gewees, dis die val wat ons daar gehad het. So, the growth on the, on the normal group was 1.5 kilos overall, which is not ideal for a feedlot, you're looking more towards 1.6, 1.7, but that was driven by the, by the cold and the wet. On the bulls, we had a 1.3 kilogram growth rate over the total uh, period, Luckily, we had drains. I don't want it to be higher preparing a bull. 1.3, 1.4, that, that's about it. Even 1.2. You don't want to grow it too fast and you're accumulating fat and, and that's detrimental for the animal. So, you look, there's some of the other work that I always as us now proof work do and try a bit of data out there. I know in the feedlot industry, they're looking at the forearm of the animal. They say there's a correlation before the form arm development and the potential growth rate of the animal going forward. So I did some calculations there. I got a 0.4 uh, correlation between ADGs in the feedlot and the forearm circumference. Maar ek was bykie stout ook gewees, jylle, en het ook klomp foto's van die diere geneem. En som onder my collega's getoets. Want ek die selle dier van twee kante af afgeneem, dan lyk hy maar aan die ene kant en vet aan die ander kant, en dan krijg ek twee antwoorde daar uit. So, maak by seker, daar is waarschijnlijk iets in, om na voorarm van die dier te kyk, die correlatie wat ek gekryd is so 0.4 gewees. So, um, gebruik miskien my eder die skaal, hy is daar ook bykie akkerater as, as, as wat jou oog gaan wees daar so. Johan mentioned, when, when the vets are looking at the fertility of the animal, or the seed quality, whatever you, you would like to name it. I did not know there's so much attributes that you can look into in seed for, for an animal. And exactly what he said. There on the farm at the back of the bucky, that's just a quick assessment. If I correct you on, just quickly, yeah, this is looking okay. But you need to go to the laboratory to look at everything there. And, and it's quite interesting to hear this technology that's helping these guys now with, with this. What we've seen in, in this trial, the animals on the high energy diet, the typical feedlot diet, and Johan quickly mentioned that. On the tails, 
a typical score of, of tails that's not correct would be quite low. We are 2.9% on, no, uh, would be quite low on the, on the, on the high fiber diet, low energy, high fiber diet, we had 3% of the, of the seed that, that had tails that was not correct. On the high energy diet, we had, uh, what's it, 20 or 28? 20. Ja, maar jylle, ek wacht vir my nieuwe bril, so ek het een klik specially op, so ek voel of soos Peter is wat op die water loop. So the first thing that really came out there, on the high energy diet, the tails was busted on those uh, animals that were fed the high energy uh, diet. What happened, the vet told me, uh, Mariki said, Johan, if you quickly look, you will see there's movement there, and you can make the assessment, there's movement, is everything fine. But those guys with the twisted tails are not swimming straight forward. They're swimming in circles, whatever. Johanna, kijk naar jou. Is er die rechte stelling om te maak? Dankie. So, hier jou moet die gedraaide ster swim om vrek, maar jy kan nie by die target uitkom nie, jylle. En dis net om nie te veel milies vir die bal gegeet. So, be careful of too much maize in your, in your diet. The one other one that was also there was the secondary geslagskleren, wat seminale vesikels, wat zou so dit wees? Johan, kan jy help? Yes. What, what they do, but she also told me on, this is a subjective assessment because I feel it and I give it a score. But also, the score on those with the, with the high energy level were, were out of spec there. Although subjective, that's the one thing you picked up. The other one, definitely... On the seat, the, the, the tails, we had problems there on the high energy uh, one. I think that's the most significant one. And also, net in, I sat in the end job, you know, but I see how it comes. So, as I didn't have to swim, I didn't have to swim, I didn't have to swim, I all the other good letters and inspect for both of them were was. What I did. When we slaughtered the animals, I dissected the, the uh, testes, I've cut the fat off, put it one side, and I measured the fat and the, the testicles physically. Basically the same for both groups. About 70-30 split in, on a weight base between the testicle size and the fat that's been deposited. We all have this story about the fat, the fat that's depositing there just where the scrotum enters the body and is detrimental, whatever. I thought it would be quite easy to see. We've cut it there and took some photos, but obviously my measurement method was not correct because to make a call there and say the one is more than the other one is just, I won't go there, although there's something to it. Um, I think the most important one was, there was what was quite interesting, exactly in the total scrotum, exactly the same amount of fat in both, in both testicles. Although on the high energy one, we know the, 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 the seed was busted there. The next one, we looked at the rumens. Um, another vet came in and he did the rumen scores for us. In both groups, 100% rumen scores for all the animals. I know we, we tend to say, yeah, if it's a very hard ration, you burn the rumen and whatever. Rumen burns, and I'll show you a photo right, right now what the rumen looks like, but we don't want to see. You can feed animals on quite high energy uh, rations without developing rumen problems if your feedlot management is up to scratch. Usually when we're on a ration of let's say about 9 or 10% fiber, there's a tendency to develop more rumen problems there. Those problems is usually pay weekend on that Monday morning when the vet called me and say, one come go some with me, it's a problem. Hy dier was saterdag ochend nog recht gevoer, hy het sondag mar saterdag marag honger gestaan, sondag ochend die manne laat ingekom, hy het nie lekker symptome gehad nie, vinnig het lomkoos uitgegooi, en dis waar ons moeilijk uitgekom het. Niks fout met die brandsoen nie. So kribak bestuur jylle is kritisch in, 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 in roem en gezondheid. For our English speaking people, the, 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 the way you're feeding two or three times a day, whatever it may be, consistent every day, the same day, and your mixing of the ration also. Make sure there. It's got a huge influence on your, your rumen um, health. This is what we don't want to see. You probably can't see it very nice from there, 
but that villi in the rumen, it get burnt, the rumen pH drop. Usually it's at the bottom of the rumen, the, the weight of, of, of the acid that's been formed by the mace is quite heavy, it's laying at the bottom of the rumen, and you lose that villi of the animal. Yeah, it's much better. And you lose that villi. They, they do recover those animals. But those, the total su surface that's been utilized to absorb of uh, the uh, nutrients. nutrients, that absorb your nutrients, is gone. And we often hear a bull come to the farm and the bull fall out my car out and he's not lekker nie, want he was oorvoer gewees. Maybe that was part of your problem. Just the management in the feedlot itself, as well as two alterations, it also can, can, can lead to that. Misschien net a vinnige een jylle daar, um, ons is lief om voerkalk in ons rantsoen te gooi. Ons sê, maar gooi bykie voerkalk by, we putting feed lime into the ration, and this will help, it will uh, alleviate your, your rumen pH. Please, uh, feed lime has got no influence out of a practical point of view for um, controlling rumen acidosis. Your first, second, and third way to control rumen acidosis with enough roughage in your ration. If your ration is not formulated correctly in the first place, no acidosis control is going to help. So first, make sure there's enough high-quality roughage in your ration. The other thing about the, the feed lime that we like to add to it, feed lime is primary of calcium source for us in, in a ration. But feed lime has got another problem. It's very high in iron also. Now, Johan told you about iron when an animal is sick to put some additional iron in, 100%. But in a total ration, South Africa, in our I'm speaking normal circumstances now, we've got a lot of iron in our felt. You will see in our premixes we took out iron because iron has got a detrimental effect on the absorption of other uh, micro uh, elements. Now you're chucking in a lot of feed line with a lot of iron and you pick up other problems going forward, maybe sickness of some kind, lung disease, whatever. But some of the trace minerals maybe was not absorbed correctly because you had too much iron and calcium is ook a blikskoppelje. Hy onderdruk ook het omskoor mineral opname. So, jy soek a calcium fosfor verhouding in die rand, so jy 2 tot 1. Pas op met klomp voorkalk bij te gooi, jy maak meer skade as wat jy goed doen. Die, die, die probleem ook wat gebeur, Dit is nie daar alleen maar oog en drie dood nie. Jou productie word net bykie benadeel en jy kan nie die waarreg jou vinger daar opleen nie. Maar ek krijg baie keer, die ons maak die mooiste randsoene en dan gooi sommer so paar grabe voerkalk by. Dan trek hy kalsie en fosfor verhouding hier na vier tot een toe en ergens raak ons vir die wet kwaad want die eindstof het nie recht gewerk nie. Maar jou sinkopname was nie recht gewees nie, het nie te veel kalsie in my randsoene gehad. So be careful to use too much feed line, please. So, if you want to do your own uh, ration formulation there, we're looking at the energy level around about 70-73%. That's it. Protein, I think I put down there 14, higher than 14, preferably 15% uh, uh, protein. Fiber as high as possible. So to start out, start with 20-25% high quality roughage and then start uh, putting under the, the, the rest of the of the ration. Maar moet nie onder 20% kom nie hulle. Ek persoonlik hou verkrikkelijk van lucerne en bolrandsoen. Ek weet daar so hier en daar geleide wat die ouwe sê, maar die molibdeen vlakke is te hoog. Julle van die kiddes wat ek met die bulle werk, het ons nog nooit moeilijk uit gehad nie. So lucerne, en nie jou heel beste lucerne. Lucerne, second grade lucerne, with a little bit of grass in, maybe add some rain on it, excellent, 100% if you use some lucerne in the bull ration. Misschien om die bulles een klaar te maak, oor, voor ons daar kom, net aan die, aan die rantsoen kant, rather start preparing your bulls for your auction earlier than later, at least five months before the auction. Usually the phone call is there three months before the auction, bulls are not looking right, ek soek een warm rantsoen, die goed moet mooi wees, en dis waar ons vir die seer maak. Jy het nou vir twee jaar die bulle bitter mooi opgepast, en nou nek jylle op met Net te veel milies vir een maand, julle. Sublief. Begin nie eerder te lang voor die tijd. 
We also had a look at the, at the hooves of these animals because the hoof growth is always a problem. In the feed industry, we often get the, the call, yes, um, your, your, your ration was too hot or is something wrong with your ration. I had, I had problems with hooves growing out on, on, on the bulls. And one of the things that we have to do is what is susceptible to this. And this is genetic, I don't think it's going to be too much. I don't know if you can see it. So here is a, a four-crawl study that we have done. It's a lot of other reasons. Normal feedlot, typical four rations, very good, nice growth there, 1.8 kilograms per day for all four treatments. Feed conversion ratios are 5.5 on an as-is base which is excellent for a feedlot. So real nice, everything firing on all the cylinders, good feedlot results there. There were four animals in, in the total group. I think there were 60 animals. There were four animals that developed with problems there. I took out one of those animals' performance. He grew around about 1.5 kilogram per day, that animal. When he started developing the hoof problems, he dropped to negative growth rates. Julle, dit is ongelooflik seer vir die dieren. Hulle gaan le, hulle staan op hulle knie, julle sal weet wat van ek praat. Dit is rechtig slecht. If, if you start seeing a hoof problem in your herd, in, in, especially in the feedlot or preparing your bulls, take that animal out, put him on the felt, go another route with him. My experience is they, they do recover quite nicely, but the moment he just walked past a bag of mice, it's there, it's back again. So, try to get rid of that animal. Now, back to the problem, how is hoof problems related to bulls and going forward? Just maybe the driver for the hoof problem, it's rumen related, your pH dropped too low, some rumen acidosis, cause some infection on the, on the hoof side, and it's there, it's there, you can't do anything going forward. The only way is to, to get out of the feedlot with the animal. So, what I did here, I, I've plotted 60 animals there, growth rates, feedlot growth rates. The, uh, the average was about 1.8 kilogram in, in this total. The four animals that developed problems on, on hooves here were all four, all four animals were sub average on growth rates in the feedlot. So, so what I feel is, say, as you begin hoof problem, cry and it's Twee en drie percent en zelfs vijf percent van die populatie. Dus het dier wat niet aangepast is voor de voerkraal niet. Dus het dier wat niet groei, wil groeien kan groeien niet. Als, als die andere 95 percent kan presteren in die kraal onder de omstandigheden, gaat de meer daar aan zoen. Is dit iedere dier probleem als er aan zoen probleem. When you start in getting 10, 15 percent hoof problems, ration related. Child management related, definitely so. But there's always a couple of animals that's got hoof problems. For all you as you op a, op a ransoen, in ieder geval op a 20% refoer and sluiting hoof probleme kry, dan wil jy nie met die bol voor en toe gaan. Jy gaan veel probleme geem. Om ons stem daar ook nie saam my stelling nie, maar as, as a dier nie onder, met a la energie die eet met a 20-25% refoer en sluiting, as hy daar wil gaan probleme vir ons gee, Hy gaan vir ons ander moeilikheid voor en toe ook gee. En hy die data uit, dit is in elk geval die onderpresteerders in die kudde gewees. Dit is in elk geval nie ons beste groeiers en ons beste vooromzet vrouwers gewees. Dit is waarschijnlijk ook om hy die probleem ontwikkel het. Why, why am I making this statement? There is technology available, like um, some of the buffers and whatever, that you can include into the ratio and prevent this youth growth. Do you want to prepare a bull for the market that the buyer from you is going to utilize in his herd, producing wiener calves that's got a potential problem with hooves? What's happening today in the feedlot industry? They know exactly where which calf comes from which from. They keep record of that. So in future, you start having problems getting a good price for your calf because the feedlot say, um, course the colors geef my hoofprobleme in die kudde. Of in die, in die, in die voerkral. So the feedlot can trace back hoof problems to your farm with their record keeping system. But somebody along the line have sold a bull to the, to the Wienerkoff guy that's got a tendency to hoof problems. So jylle wat ek vraag, 
as een bol vir jou hoef, moet ek uitgee, net in die voorbereidingsfase, raak ons slaaf van die bol. Moe nie met tricks probeer, en ons kan dit doen, maar die teler verkoop hom nou aan iemand, die kallers word in een kudde gebruik voor en toe, dit doen ons industrie nie goed. Nee, as jy bullet met probleem is, dan blief raak ons slaaf van die bol. Right, oh, wat het ons nog daarby? Nou, ons is alweer gepraat. I'm quickly going to run through this. What about gossipol? Well, I'm referring to gossipol. It's the yellow brownish substance in cotton oil cake. Now we like to utilize cotton oil cake in bull rations. Selfs koon katoen saad jylle. En jy veel lekker tip en dit werk en is nie sonder nie kan dit maar doen. As jy vir die laaste maand 5% skoon katoen saad in jou bol ramsoen gaat sit. Jou dier is een hardleed gaan mooi wees. Ek waarborg het veel. Ga nie jou saad seer maak nie. But there's a thing about gossipol, and it's poisonous and detrimental for, for health. Now, I'm not going to go into the technical part there. Kobus, ek sal die data kan ons beskikbaar stel vir die ouwens oor. Ek kan vir die lees en geer, dan ken jy al die data hier oor. Gossipol, there's a free one and, and, uh, and a binded one. The binded one, it binds to the protein, and that's why we've got a detrimental effect on, on, on total growth rates of animals. But gossipol also do have a problem it can cause infertility with bulls. In dairies, also gossip oil can be a problem, especially if you feed it for a long extended uh, period of time. The, the main thing of gossip oil, I think the top level, I've put it down there, somewhere there for you, 24 grams. Just make sure when you get your gossip oil analysis, there's about three ways they express it, that you not confuse yourself with what's happening. The bottom line on the gossipol one, you don't want to exceed 24 grams of gossipol per animal per day. So, if you look at all the data, you can read it through there when, when, when I've sent it through to you. You can put in about, around about a kilo to two kilograms of cotton oil cake, and all cotton oil cake do have gossipol. It's just how much. But if your bulls eat about a kilogram of cotton oil cake for six or eight weeks or even longer extended, let's say three months in the preparation period, no problem there. You won't pick up fertility problems. So that's why I'm easily telling you 5% uh, cotton seed in a bull ration, that's 700 grams of cotton, it equals to 4.8 grams of gossipol. Our maximum levels that we want to go to is 24 grams of gossipol per animal per day. So take note of the gossipol thing. I've explained there everything, how it works and where it's got an influence. As jy my doeners vis aan varkaboer, bly weg van katoen, wil ek ook al voor. Die ouwens haar het gossipol het daar rechtig dramatiese invloed. So, maar by roem en dier, nie daar een groot nie julle, bykie katoen wil ek ook of so in jou bol rantsoen, geen probleem nie. En katoen wil ek ook is waarschijnlijk van ons heel beste proteinbronne uit die ammunitie hoogpunt wat ons kan gebruik. Is rechtig een briljant een, so ons is baie lief om om by die bilrandsoene te gebruik. Die laaste een waarover ek wil praat is oor ionofore en bilrandsoene julle. Nou wat is ionofore? I want to say something about ionofores. Ionofore is not a hormoon. Hormoon is die ding wat jy toonig het en jy laat karre rol en smak so goed aanvang, nee. Hierdie, hierdie is, ionofoor is nie hormoon nie julle. Wat die ionofoor doen in a, in a beese roemen, you've got a microbial population of quite a couple sorts of microbial um, guys living there. It just enhances the environment for one of the, the, the microbes living there to have an alleviated propionic acid production for us. Propionic acid, propi yeah, sekker, propionic acid. It's good for muscle development. So that's the main purpose of Iano 4. It is ook nie antibiotica nie. Hy loop so op die grens. Ek sal nou nie na jou hand kyk as ek nou dit die stelling maak nie. Hy loop so op die grens van die, van die antibiotica, maar is nie, hy is nie geregistreer as antibiotica nie. So al wat die Iano 4 hier doen, hy swaai bykie die Roman populatie om, om vir ons goeie propionsierproduksie te gee. En vir ons verbeter die dierenprestatie. Now some of the old wives tales running around, it's got a very detrimental effect on bull fertility. And unfortunately, in the marketing environment, people will try everything to, to sell his product amongst another one. 
You can go. I've put in a couple of articles there for you. Very significant work has been done in the USA, especially on Munensen. And the, it's the culprit, because Munensen is the one being named in, in, in South Africa, and the majority of companies, all the big ones, use Munensen for good reasons. It's an excellent product. The one you will pick up is Munensen 20, uh, or Rumensen 20. The active there is Munensen. And this is the one that's been said. Now it's detrimental for, for bull fertility, whatever. Very, very nice work being done in the US. With a fit um, rumensin to, to animals, reproductive herds. Done some embryo work on them. Going forward from their uh, AI work with it for a couple of years in a herd. The bottom line of everything there, I've listed everything there, quite a long list. Actually, Munensen had a very positive effect on fertility all over. That's the bottom line. Don't have a detrimental effect on bull fertility. Actually, it's positive for bull fertility. Not that I want to say you must feed Munensen. It's very nice to have. It's not uh, important that it must be there. But for over uh, rumen health and gut health, it's just positive. There's nothing negative about it. And I want to emphasize that. You will pick it up in industry. It's not true. It's old wife style. Good. Finishing off. On the bulls, if we want to feed them, 20-25% uh, good quality roughage, 40-45% maize, the rest of, of your concentrates and etc. going forward. Um, let me up. 25%. On the hooves, I've made my point. If you've got an animal, it's less than 3 and 4% of the total herd. It's a genetic problem. We don't want to hear that, but I'm pretty sure, or something else. But it's not a ration problem. It's, if it's running into 10% and more, definitely we must look at ration and trial management with the animals. Cotton oil cake, do have gossip pole. Take note of it, don't worry too much. Don't feed three kilograms of cotton oil cake for four months for your bulls. The vet is gonna ask some questions when he's looking at the seed there. Just maybe, I forgot that one. When, when we've got a problem now with high energy feed and you have a problem with seed that's not up to scratch, the vet is not happy with it, it's a reversible process. So if you take those bulls off that, that uh, high energy ration, six, eight weeks, you should be okay again. But it's a, you, your, your bull auctions is usually as close as possible to the breeding season. So the time frame there to, to correct that is, 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 is not the way to go. So it is reversible. It's not a, a permanent problem that you have there. Iron of force, yes, um, I've made my point. Don't have a detrimental effect on, on, uh, on fertility. In heifers, cows, and bulls, no, no, no problem there. I think the, the biggest, from a feeding point perspective, the biggest problem that we see in total industry too much maize in our in our bull rations. End of story. And I know what's the problem. You see, if I say the bull is not fed, it gets no price. No, no, what the bull is saying is, "Oh, it's it's more so. But all of me buy geld off for it. So it is so two sides in the sword. You can a bull buy a more great mark. You listen to the one with the long minister Peter in his queer queer spirit and muscle and tackle and tell it. And that's my total story. Good. Thanks.